So welcome to Scrolling to Death. I'm super excited to be joined by Claire Morrell, who is an author, a senior policy analyst, a fellow and director of the Human and Flo- Nope. Technology and Human (laughs) Flourishing Project. Can you tell us about this project? It sounds really interesting. Yes. So we started this project three years ago, I think when more awareness was growing about the harms to kids um, from social media and smartphones and online pornography. And just realizing that these things were detrimental to human flourishing, um, that they were harming families, harming children. And so we decided to start a project um, basically focused on Uh, what policy solutions are needed to help parents better protect their kids online. So we've been focused on legislation, both at the federal level and state level, and and then also have tried to put out resources that will be helpful to parents who are on the front lines, as well as educators in schools. And so I think, um, you know, it's very much a comprehensive approach. We have tried to focus a lot on improving our laws to back parents up up and also trying to equip parents who are on the front lines and then also addressing schools and the role that they critically play in helping parents um, provide the kind of technology experience they want to their children if they want to um, protect them from these harms. So that's kind of what the project is focused on. That's amazing. And I appreciate the resources for parents as well. And a lot of times when I talk about a harm, uh, a social media harm, and I often blame the social media company, um, people will say things like, you know, parents' fault and parents should be managing that. Where do you feel like the responsibility lies when it comes to kids accessing harmful content online? This is such a good question. I'm so glad you asked it because I get very frustrated when I would say like opponents to a lot of the policy legislation I advocate for. So big tech lobbyists um, and their allies say, well, it's on parents. Like here's these parental tools and controls and parents can just control their kids online experience. And Mm -hmm. While I would say, of course, parents are ultimately responsible for what happens to their kids, it's not that simple when you are putting a parent and a parental control and time limit against an incredibly powerful and addictive technology, a technology literally designed to addict um, everyone, all its users, but particularly vulnerable children um, who still have developing brains. And so I don't think it's a fair fight to say it's on parents to try to completely police this. I think for a couple of reasons as well, that even a time limit or kind of parental control doesn't mitigate all the kind of social environment factors that these technologies have created. Um, and so even when a kid is not actively on the device, they're still kind of mentally consumed by what's happening in the app. Who's liked my post? Who has, you know, um, responded to my latest photo or liked me or followed me? And so I think, um, you know, there, there was even a study done by the University of North Carolina that wasn't about the amount of time time kids spent on the app, but just um, kids who are habitually checking it. So nothing about the total amount of time they spent, but if uh, they were regularly checking social media, it led to divergent brain development over time. And I think it just speaks to how even if you place time limits and all these parental controls, there can still be harmful effects that a parent on their own just can't mitigate. And that's really, it's on the companies because it's the nature, the way they've designed the technologies are inherently addictive. Um, They induce this dopamine response, and it's particularly harmful for children's developing brains. And so to tell parents, it's on you, just put time limits and parental controls, all the parents I've spoken with feel extremely frustrated because they're doing that, and they feel like one mom put it to me. She's like, it's like me and a drug dispensing machine and my child's brain. And they're just trying to say, like, I need to be between this drug dispensing machine and my child's developing brain. And it's just it's not a fair fight to parents. Um, And so that's why I think you may have alluded to this. Like, I've been advocating for laws that are needed to back parents up. Um, Mm -hmm. Some laws are really trying to address the nature of the technology and make companies responsible um, for mitigating certain harms in their product design, like the Kids Online Safety Act, which I think you've been outspoken on just trying to encourage parents to, to raise their voices on that particular piece of legislation. Um, and so I think the other piece I would say is when they say it's on parents is there is no parental involvement in a child getting on social media. Um, even parents who say, I'm trying to keep my kids off, I'm trying to delay this, 
what's to stop their child from just making an account on a friend's computer <laughs> or friend's device when all that you have to do is just, um, you know, enter a birth date and click a box and you have a social media account. So there is no true parental involvement or empowerment um, in in the process of getting a social media account. And so I have really tried to say, yes, parents are responsible for their children, but this is an incredibly addictive and powerful technology. And with other technologies like tobacco or alcohol, we recognize that that's not on individual parents to police, that it's just harmful to kids. And so we've age restricted it out of childhood. And no one would say that a tobacco age restriction is somehow disempowering a parents, they would say, oh, great, we've solved this collective action problem. Now individual parents don't have to fight these battles with their own kids. And so I'm trying to kind of advocate that it should be the same for social media, that the evidence is now clear. And so, yes, parents are doing their best, but we need to have better legal policy solutions to back them up. Yes, agree. And thank you for breaking that down so clearly. Um, and in my conversations with a lot of parents who have actually lost a child due to a social media harm, and many of them had all the parental controls on, mm-hmm. had all the conversations, uh, delayed giving a device, did all the things that they were supposed to do to keep their kids safe, and that harm still happened mm-hmm. to their child. So we just have to be very clear about we can only do so much, mm-hmm. but the companies also have a responsibility. And you mentioned... I mean, one of the biggest issues for me is you have young children getting on these platforms that are even too young for the platform's That's right. own restriction, yep. but also I feel too young to be on the platform anyway when they're 13. Um, how come we haven't been able to enforce age restrictions on these platforms? This is like the most maddening question. I feel like mm-hmm. if you, because I think once parents are like, okay, this stuff is bad. And they're like, wait, why is the age 13? And wait, why aren't even the platforms enforcing that age? And it's, I mean, it's all like legal history, so I won't get too weedy. But basically, I mean, no law to protect children online has passed Congress since like 1998. And that was the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And it was supposed to be about data collection, saying that parents have to consent to have their child, if they're under the age of 13, they have to consent to their data being collected. So this was well before social media was invented. So then social media came about. And in order to comply with that law, they're like, well, we don't want to have to get parental consent. We're just going to make the age for social media because their whole business model is collecting our data. Um, We'll just make it 13. But there's no age verification requirements in COPPA. And um, COPPA's uh, legal kind of liability mechanism, the kind of proof of a company being in violation of it is very high. It's like the strictest standard of legal liability, which is actual knowledge. And so it's been very difficult to even enforce to say like these companies had actual knowledge that there were underage kids on their platforms. And so this is why a lot of um, the colleagues and allies I work with, we're trying to get an update (laughs) to these laws because there is no like there's only kind of an age restriction based on COPPA, but it's not even able to be effectively enforced because it's not tied to age verification requirements or anything where the companies actually have to make sure that minors aren't on um, their accounts. And they aren't, they don't have a business interest in keeping kids off their platforms. Like rather the opposite is that the younger, and I think this, you know, has even come out in some of the documents that have now become publicly kind of available through some of the lawsuits that the state attorney generals have brought against Meta showing that they internally have even discussed like the younger we can addict a user or hook a user, the more we can profit off them over their lifetime. And they've even quantified that, like making Mm -hmm. money off of a child from say the age of 13 when they get on their platform, they're worth like $270 um, Mm -hmm. over the course of their lifetime. So they have monetized literally our children's attention. Um, so all that to say, they're not interested in keeping kids off. And so unless we require them to do it and hold them accountable for it by law, they're just not going to. Yeah. And the there was some leaked documents from the Kentucky AG's lawsuit against, I think this was for TikTok. Mm-hmm. And TikTok was sort of informing their internal moderators if a an account if an account is uh, reported as being underage, you can't remove them unless the child has indicated that they are underage <laughs> through the through the date of birth, which they wouldn't even be able to, been able to sign up in the first place. And and we know that these companies are re aging people on the back end, like they know really how old kids are. Um, but 
actual knowledge? Like that wouldn't, I guess, be considered actual knowledge. I think it's very difficult to prove like you would have to essentially have some type of documentation that shows Mm -hmm. their actual age. And so it's just, I do think though, these AG lawsuits, I'm very interested to keep following this because I think this is the first real effort I've seen to actually enforce COPPA against these companies. And I think it's because it's gotten so blatant that they are recruiting children. Um, And so I'm hoping through these lawsuits trying to end the discovery of producing some of these internal documents that they they might be able to, you know, satisfy that standard to say, okay, these companies actually knew that they had children Mm -hmm. and they didn't do anything to remove those accounts. And so historically, companies have been able to avoid moving to trial with these lawsuits because of some immunity shields from the 90s that they're um, pointing to. But are you seeing that these AG lawsuits will potentially move forward versus the social media companies? I mean, I, I'm i hopeful, but I will just say, like, this is why I continue, I feel like, to beat the same drum about why we do yeah. need a change in our laws is because it's still such an uphill battle for them. Like, 42 state attorney generals are having to come together and, like, really bring the full force <laughs> of their offices against these giant tech companies. And it's because it's often just been a very div- David versus Goliath sized fight. These companies are huge, they're very powerful. They have incredible lobbying resources and attorneys. And with Section 230, I think the law that you were alluding to as their immunity shield, they've been able to get most cases against them just totally dropped at the motion to dismiss stage. Um, and that law was meant to shield internet platforms from being held liable for third-party content that they were purely hosting or transmitting. I think where that law has unfortunately been overexpanded by the courts beyond its original meaning is to now basically shield companies from any sort of wrongdoing, even their own Mm -hmm. product design, like addictive features that are harming kids, like infinite scroll or autoplay or extremely aggressive recommendation algorithms. Um, And so I'm hopeful these state attorney general's lawsuits will continue to go forward and be successful, but we need to give them more tools um, in the sense that overcoming Section 230 is still a really big task and to really prove that the reason that these kids are being harmed is is the company's own wrongdoing, not some type of third-party speech hosted on the platform. And so um, I do think that they, that I hope these lawsuits will start to poke some uh, holes in that immunity shield, um, but they certainly could use help from, from Congress as well. Okay. And one really effective example of this is uh, 10-year-old Nyla Anderson from yeah. Pennsylvania. TikTok served her, without searching for it, That's served right. her the choking challenge video, right? And mm-hmm. she tried it and passed away. Now, isn't that on the platform for proactively serving that to her without her uh, seeking it out? I would absolutely argue yes. And um, right. the attorney representing her mother, who has filed this wrongful death lawsuit against TikTok, um, they initially faced challenges at the district court level for their case because of Section 230. Um, and they appealed it. And the Third Circuit actually like let their appeal go forward. And so I'm hopeful um, they you know, pointed out some very interesting things in that opinion to say, listen, this is uh, this cannot be you cannot behind hide behind Section 230 um, for something that your algorithm promoted to this girl. Like she would not have found it otherwise. Um, that's on you. Yes. Like the challenge may have been someone else's content, but like mm-hmm. she probably never would have found it if they hadn't literally put it in her for you feed. And so I think I'm hopeful like cases like this. And good judges really carefully reading the law and looking at the facts of the case will say, oh, yeah, Section 230 was never meant to apply to this type of conduct. This is on the companies. It's their own wrongdoing. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And so you are, you know, recommending and suggesting that we need new legislation or amended legislation Mm -hmm. to help enforce um, some of this. So that this year was and is the Kids Online Safety Act. What is currently happening with COSA? Yeah, so COSA, I mean, very encouragingly passed the Senate. Um, I think it was like 91 to 3, and I don't quote me on that. Okay, that's right. (laughs) I was like, I know there was only three votes against it. It was, um, which is, I mean, that's a tremendously bipartisan, like in our current Mm -hmm. political climate, to have a bill pass 91 to 3, I think just shows that lawmakers recognize that parents need help and that the companies can't keep getting away with these harms. And I think as we mentioned, like this bill would really make a difference um, to parents because it would 
uh, make sure, make the companies have to design their products with children's safety in mind, that it would be on them to mitigate a very specific list of harms in what's called the bill's duty of care to say that you have to make sure that your product design features, again, not the content that you're hosting. We understand you still have Section 230. COSA would not touch that which is another myth I feel like people have misunderstood somehow trying to uh, mislabel this bill as some type of censorship bill. It has nothing to do with content at all. It's all about product design. And to say that they would be responsible for making sure that it's not leading to sexual exploitation of children or um, promoting them things that are inherently dangerous for them, like narcotics or drugs, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, other things that we yeah. know aren't safe for children. And so it's mm-hmm. a very um, common sense solution. And now um, it has gone to the House. And I think, unfortunately, it has kind of stalled there. But we're hoping that it will find a path forward. And I think that the more parents that raise their voices and let their members of Congress know that they want this to pass, um, the better. And, um, and I'm hopeful, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get to a yes and that whatever kind of concerns some members of the house have raised can be clarified and ironed out because I, I don't think there's any reason that we can't get behind this bill. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And I'll include clear instructions for parents on what to do to support that with their representatives in the house. But if um, we're not lucky in this this year, yeah, what would happen next year? Do you think we would um, try again for COSA? Or is there new legislation we would work on? Like, what happens next? That's actually a great question. Um, the thing is, like, this t- the technologies are like evolving so much too that you know I don't know if COSA doesn't pass, like, would it get reintroduced in its current form, or would there be something um, that's kind of like COSA but is more tailored? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think something that I've been working on, though, with um, some other allies, and it's I think there's momentum growing behind it. I think some members will introduce this bill is actually trying to also address the issue of the app stores. So the app mm-hmm. stores are really the brokers um, of these different apps, particularly social media platforms. And there is a mm-hmm. lot um, that could be done at the app store level if we had kind of age verification and parental consent in the app stores, if they're kind of the gatekeepers to all these platforms, like that would be really empowering for parents. Um, And it would also make sure that parents could consent to every instance of an app download or app store transaction for children Mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they're truly effectively controlling what apps are on children's devices or not. Um, So that's kind of a newer solution that I think um, is gaining momentum as people kind of look and they say, wait a second, most kids are accessing all this stuff on smartphones or iPads. What if we tried to kind of like look at the different choke points and we realize, oh, a big choke point, how all of this is kind of starting is in the app stores. What if we took kind of the age verification idea and applied it to app stores, um, knowing that they're kind of the entry point for children to these things. And you could even then like layer onto that certain requirements. Um, like once we understand this device is owned, you know, owned and used by a child, certain right. defaults would just be required to be enabled on the phone. So parents don't have to go fumbling through like five different menus and settings to just turn on an adult website filter, but that if they realize this is an under 18 year old, that would just be enabled by default. So I think there's a lot that could be done at the app store level. um, And I do think that a bill um, addressing that is going to be introduced um, probably in this Congress, but then, you know, it may need to be reintroduced in the next Congress. So, and I'll note that I just realized recently that a lot of these social media platforms, TikTok, Instagram, um, are labeled actually as 12 plus in the app store. Do you know why that is? No, a mom <laughs> and I were talking about this. She's like, this doesn't make sense. And I think it's because, I mean, the only thing we could come up with is like the app store has just like a couple different age range, like groupings. And so they just have picked like 12 plus, 17 plus, and like nine plus as their categories. And you're like, but actually social media is not 12 plus, it's 13 plus. Um, yeah, so right. that's like already a disparity. And I think that's, again, just a frustration for parents is they also feel like these app ratings aren't accurate. Um, they're not transparent. They don't have full information to make a decision whether or not to let a kid on an app just because there's really not any type of just common understanding um, in the app stores. Mm -hmm. And I will say it's just, it's been interesting. I feel like Apple and Google have kind of kept their heads down when all the attention's been on Meta and TikTok. Like, don't really look at us. Um, But they're obviously benefiting off of all these apps. And I think, you know, for the apps 
that people have to purchase, they make like a commission off of those. They make a lot of ad revenue off of the app store and off of, you know, just ads on these, yeah, in the app stores and for these apps. And so I think it's just important to uh, think about the role that they play in in trying to kind of Mm -hmm. have have more requirements around what they should be responsible for doing as well to protect kids. Yeah. Okay. So I think it was like X is a, is 17 plus in the app store, which is interesting because you can be 13 as well for X. So how they differentiate is really confusing. I um, think that they think- actually had to update that because Twitter decided to allow adult content. Like X changed their policy. I don't know if you followed this at all, but a little they bit. basically got like told that there was adults kind of pornographic content all over their platform. And this is like, you know, not safe for kids. You're not doing a very good job of removing child exploitation and other things from your platform. And they decided rather than try to police it, they're just going to formally change their policy that like adult content is allowed on X. And so I think in order to uh, meet their terms and conditions for the app store, they had to change it to 17 plus. Okay. But yeah, I mean, a child could still go make an X account. For sure. It just, yeah. 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 So changing the rating. A lot of parents. So one, there's also so much sexual content on Snapchat and Instagram and mm-hmm. TikTok and all those other platforms. Yeah. But like parents rely a lot on, most parents give their kids a, an iPhone still mm-hmm. and they rely on the parental controls by age rating for mm-hmm. which apps can be downloaded. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm glad you brought up Apple though, because there is a lot of focus on the social media companies and the social media companies don't they like kind of point the finger at Apple? Oh, they're Apple totally the pointing <laughs> the fingers at each other. Like it's very interesting. This whole kind of like big tech group that I think we for a while treated as just like this united kind of group of tech companies is definitely cannibalizing. Like they're just all kind of like, wait, no, it's them. Don't look at us. Look at this other. Cause I feel like they recognize yeah. the pressure um, building from parents um, that they like want. Um, yeah, accountability. And so I do think that's interesting. Um, yeah, I also do think like the apps, the app stores and the device manufacturers are like also not trying to really, in my opinion, do very much to help parents. Like they advertise having parental controls, but I mean, you can read reports in the Wall Street Journal. Like there's so many bugs in like Apple screen time. They don't make it easier intuitive for parents to turn on all these settings. Um, Mm -hmm. it doesn't really remove any of the kind of advertisements. Like this one mom was like, I made sure that like his, my son's phone was like only 12 plus, um, or sorry. Yeah. Like, you know, didn't want anything under for a child that was like not safe for kids over 12. But then like in a game he was playing, there were still advertisements for like very explicit websites, but like, Mm -hmm. so It didn't really do anything to address the issue like that he was still getting ads for these things. So I do feel like there's a lot that the devices themselves could be doing and they're not doing for parents. um, And they're trying to advertise themselves as having all these parental controls, but they're very buggy and they're not effective. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I will add on to that even Apple products at schools and maybe even Chromebooks, but we have iPads at schools. And one of the students recently was playing a game called Geometry Dash, the free version at school, and was served a naked ad of a woman that was naked. It was an ad for a virtual AI girlfriend oh at school. No. And so, and there's no way that that iPad is, um, that's definitely labeled or, yeah. you know, uh, they've told the, the device that this is a child using it. Yeah. Lots of stuff like that is getting through. Yeah. Do you feel like Apple products are safe for kids? I personally do not. And I, I, yeah, I wouldn't give them to my own children. I do feel for parents, like you're mentioning with the school situation, though, where they feel like they're mandated to have these. Um, yeah, I, I really do feel like parents, it's very unfortunate. Um, but I, I don't think that they're safe in this, in the sense that I just think, the like iPad and smartphone, it's just inherently difficult for a parent to effectively oversee because there are just so many portals to the online world. There's just hundreds of thousands of apps. And mm-hmm. like we mentioned, the controls that they say that they have on the device aren't fully effective. They don't necessarily work. They don't necessarily prevent bad advertisements. There's lots of loopholes and ways to get around things that kids yeah. quickly figure out. And so for from my perspective, it's very difficult for parents 
who want to keep their kids safe to effectively oversee everything that could be happening on the device when they're really hampered in their ability to do that. And so um, my recommendation to parents has been to If you need to stay in touch with your child um, and you want them to have a phone, there are so many alternatives available now. And I actually think even more than we had even like three years ago. And I think that's because people are recognizing parents want to opt out of these smart devices um, and they want alternatives. (laughs) They want a way that they can make sure they can be in touch with their child or know their child's location or um, even have their child be able to use GPS when they're driving a car, but they don't Mm -hmm. want all the other things that can come through a smartphone, like an Apple iPhone. Mm-hmm. And so I just, in my own work, really try to recommend parents explore alternatives that they can. Um, and I think that's been, yeah, like there's many available now, like the Bark phone or the Gab phone or the Wise phone. And and the yeah. parents I know who are using these are have been very satisfied. So that's what mm-hmm. I, that's my biggest recommendation is to try to find alternatives as much as you can and where schools require it. Um, I mean, that's a different story. And I think that's probably like another yeah, reason to keep pushing for policy changes um, at the school level. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I feel like every parent should be considering a, a safer device, a device that was built for kids, not built for adults, right. and then tried to like um, bandaged up on top. But kids can always poke holes through to get to whatever they want to get to on a phone that was built all open to them. Yes. And so, yes, <clears throat> love Bark and love Gab and love even flip phone. Yeah. Um, what do you feel about um, the delay conversation? Like what ages should be? And I know this is very specific to each family, um, mm-hmm. but you know, Jonathan Height just put out great recommendations to wait yeah. to give a smartphone until 14. Do you agree with that? Do you feel like it should be later? Like what is your thoughts about what ages is appropriate at this point? Oh man, you're like, okay, so um, I think I mentioned, no, this is <laughs> great. I think I mentioned this to you. So I also have a book coming out um, that yes. will release next June of 2025 called The Tech Exit. Um, and I'm actually really seeking to build off Jonathan Haidt's work. We've actually talked about my book and he did the hard work, which was making the case and showing all the evidence of why smartphones and social media have rewired childhood. And I mean, he's taken a lot of heat for it. People have not been <laughs> super kind to him. But then I think mm-hmm. parents and people who have seen this firsthand are like, they feel very vindicated by his research to say, we've seen this happening. We knew something was, wasn't right about this phone-based childhood. So I actually mm-hmm. feel like the tide is turning and that more and more people want to opt out and they just want to know how to do this. And so that's what my book seeks to do. Um, it's, it seeks to kind of walk parents through like the tech exit, like how can we opt out of social media and smartphones um, and push them off as close as possible to adulthood. And so I really put a flag in the ground as 18 years old, which is, I feel like, the legal age of adulthood for a lot of things in our society. And I recognize not everyone's able to necessarily make it all the way to 18, but I feel like having that as an ideal really helps us like push them a lot further down the road. And I, mm-hmm. I like, I think having a, a collective understanding closer to that just helps each individual family be able to resist um, these devices for longer. And I, yeah. I give a lot of research on this in my book. I think, you know, we know that honestly, children's brains don't even fully develop till age 25. Like the prefrontal cortex responsible for impulse control, self-control, it's really not fully developed till 25. And so I think, again, like the longer we can give them a childhood kind of without these devices, the more mature their brain is going to be to handle them. And I think we all recognize, you know, to a certain extent, um, this technological world that we live in will mean that they have to interact with technology. But I, Mm -hmm. I do think you, we can still teach them how to use tech without putting a mini computer in their pocket, which is what like a smartphone is. Um, and so yeah. I just try to explain to parents how families have done this. I did a lot of interviews and I asked, yeah, like how do you navigate when your child needs to drive or how they want to stay in touch with friends and family? And I think um, the point is that there's a lot of other means that it doesn't mean that they have to have social media or a smartphone to have friends, to learn how to drive, to stay connected with people. Um, and yeah. all the parents I spoke of really explained that now that they're adult children, you know, have some of them honestly have decided that they just don't even want a smartphone as an adult, <laughs> um, which I think we are seeing more and more adults opting out. But then others now yeah. have smartphones or social media and they're able to use it in such a much more healthy way because mm-hmm. they've experienced um, the world and formed habits without it. And so I think sometimes 
parents are sold an argument, oh, well, give it to them now so you can like teach them how to use it responsibly so they don't just go off and binge on technology later. And so I think that it's actually the families I interviewed, I even asked that specific question, like, well, our kids, did your kids binge later? And they're like, no, it's the mm-hmm. opposite. Like they grew up without it. And so they just don't really know any different. And so That's they're cool. able to use it in a really like wise way as an adult because they like know how to have in-person conversations and they don't feel panicked if they don't have their phone on them because they didn't have one on them all the time growing up. And I think other parents have also seen the opposite where they're like, well, I thought giving it to them just even like a little bit a day would help them to use it in a healthy way. But even that kind of little bit a day is still like forming a habit and a kind of like daily compulsion to feel like you need to check or do something. And so that's where I try to explain in my book, the kind of like the myth of like screen time limits and parental controls just hasn't really worked out for parents. Like they haven't, that hasn't delivered kind of on the promise it held out. And so what Mm -hmm. if we actually considered opting out um, and opting out together? And so I think this is something Jonathan Hyatt, others have talked about that the more parents that do this, the easier it is on every individual parent. Um, and yeah, you kind of mitigate those harmful network effects where then a kid doesn't need to feel isolated if they're not on social media, if all their other friends also are not on social media. So I'm very yeah. encouraged all that to say, I think the tide is totally turning just in the last few years because of the more research coming out, you know, researchers like Jonathan Haidt. Um, and so my book really tries to help parents have a path. Um, and it's, so mm-hmm. it's, it's a very practical guide that holds out a positive vision and an ideal. And I think, you know, that was your original question is like, what's the ideal? I say 18. I think late high school is also okay. But Mm -hmm. the reason I say that is because there are so many alternatives available today. Like, I don't think, I think parents are like, oh, like, how am I going to stay in touch with my child? And I'm just trying to say there's a lot of other options. It doesn't mean they need social media and a smartphone um, to accomplish the goals that parents have for their kids. So I don't, I think that right. that's my answer is like, let's try for 18 <laughs> and it may mm-hmm. be less than that. But if, if we have that as an ideal, as a yeah. society, I think we'll move these things further and further out of childhood. Yeah. Thank you for putting your stake in the ground on that because <laughs> I feel so strongly about that. I can't, if you set that as an ideal and then that's your goal, but every month, every day that you wait, keep waiting towards that goal you're giving your child such a gift. Like you're giving your child the tools they need to develop that healthy brain and deal with conflict and, uh, and bad feelings and Mm -hmm. really like learn how to engage in person and make eye contact. That's right. Stay focused and all the things that they're missing out on when they can just go to a device every time they feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and this thing about like needing other people to do it with them. I, I know a lot of teenagers, they're only on social media because their friends are and they don't actually really like it that much, but they can't get off of it because they feel like they're going to be left out. So even if you can find just one or two other yes. families that can make this little pledge with you um, and just really know that. And I think Dr. Mitch Princeton said something like, oh, yeah, there's actually no data to suggest that kids who stay off of social media um, suffer any negative consequences. In fact, those kids usually are the ones that thrive. Yes, and, that's exactly yeah. true. Everyone I've talked yeah. to, they're like, even the kids, like I interviewed some of these grown kids, like, did you resent this? And they're like, no, like maybe at the time I was like a little frustrated, but I got over it. And they're like, now I'm so glad my parents didn't give that to me because they're like, I'm mm-hmm. interacting with my these peers in, in my college classes. And they're like, they don't know how to be without their phone. It's extremely annoying that they're like checking it a million times. We're just like trying to have a meal. And so it's like mm-hmm. they're actually able to recognize the very like unhealthy, addictive type of use. And they're like super yeah. grateful um, that they didn't have that. So, mm-hmm. okay, amazing. That's so good to hear. <laughs> and so let's talk about parents for a minute. So uh, there's a couple things here. In guiding our kids to to safer use of tech, parents also have to think about their own behavior with 100%. <laughs> what do you recommend to parents? And parents, please don't tune out right now. Like, just hear this. <laughs> that's right. No, I think that's, you know, it's so interesting, right? Like, if you're a parent and you're starting to read more and more of this research about the harms on kids, I think, like, you naturally start to think, wait, is this, like, true of me, too, then? <laughs> like, are these things not that good for us? Um, and so I actually, yeah, I have a kind of whole chapter in my book that a big part of opting out 
um, for our kids is like modeling healthy tech use as a parent. Because I think, again, that's also kind of one of my responses to parents being afraid. Well, they don't give this technology to my kids. They're going to binge later. And I'm like, well, no, they're not. Like if you're the parent and you're modeling for them how you use technology, then that's what they're going to learn to emulate. Like they they copy us for better or for worse. And so um, I'd really try to encourage parents to, as much as possible, think about ways to make your own phone like less addicting to you. Um, Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole book called How to Break Up with Your Phone by Catherine Price. And she just walked through things, just really easy things you can do, like turning app notifications off, putting apps away in folders um, so that you're really going to use them intentionally, even putting your phone in grayscale to make it like literally less less, like visually appealing and stimulating. Um, And then I'm sure, you know, you've heard this before, but a lot of these families mentioned they had like a phone box or a basket where when people came home, they like left all their devices. So they would share meals together as a family. They didn't necessarily take all their phones next to them at bedtime. They got normal alarm clocks um, and Mm -hmm. just kind of like really adopting a lot of the analog options. Like I think smartphones have become this super tool and it took all these normal things that we're using and put it on our phones. But just Mm -hmm. going back to like notepads and making old fashioned grocery lists and using a wall calendar and having a clock and wearing a watch just to make our phones less um, like needing them constantly. Like we don't have to rely on them for everything. Um, we have yeah. other tools. And so we can really turn to use the phone um, as we need to as a, as a form of communication. So I give parents kind of examples of things that they can do, even alternatives. Like if you want to opt out of a smartphone, like I personally don't have a smartphone anymore. I have a wise phone and it has everything I need as a mom. It has a camera so I can take pictures of my cute kids and has a GPS like ways so I can get around. Um, but it yeah. doesn't have social media or an internet browser. So I'm not tempted when I'm with my children to become distracted and to kind of go down a rabbit trail. Cause I'm sure everyone feels that way. You take out your phone to just look at what time it is. And then you see, Oh, you have mm-hmm. this email and this thing. And so, um, I really tried to, to model that in my own life. I wanted to be really present, um, with my kids. And then when I am using my phone, if my children are around, like I try to explain what I'm doing to them. I try yeah, to use, good. um, make phone calls more than texting just so they can hear what I'm doing instead of it being this kind of black hole mystery. Like I think that can even make the device more alluring to a child. They're like, what's this cool thing my mom is just staring at all the time in her hand. Yeah. <laughs> so I do think, um, yeah, as parents like this, it, like opting out of smartphones for our kids doesn't mean that we have to opt out as parents, but I think it certainly means we should examine our own technology use um, and think about the kind of practices that we'd want our kids to have when they're adults um, and try to adopt that in our own lifestyles to model that for them. Yeah, that was, you covered everything. I was going to jump in with a couple other things, but you covered it and that was super practical. Like, I appreciate that. And I do try to make my phone like as uncomfortable as possible to use. Like I don't have a case on it. Oh, that's great. Watching me all the time. Like just slippery and like, oh, I want to put it down. (laughs) You know, (laughs) that's such a good, I love that. I hadn't heard the thing about not having a case, but that makes so much sense. (laughs) Yeah. And and the pop socket thing that people slide their finger into on the back, like really, 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 you're just making it too easy for you to hold it and do all these other things. (laughs) <laughs> I just like super glue it to our hand at that point. Like, why are we doing this? Um, so to take the responsibility then like away from parents so we can, you know, implement some things in our home and um, delay and all of that, choose safer devices. But when it comes to advocating for the companies to take some responsibility for keeping our kids safe, what can parents do around advocacy? Oh, this is, yes. Like, I just am like, yes, we need to raise our voices as parents. I often yeah. have pointed to... um I'm sure most people are familiar with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, like mad. Mm -hmm. Like when these moms got together and mobilized in the 80s, like they accomplished change. Like the drinking Mm -hmm. age got raised, the drunk driving levels in almost like all the states got like lowered. Um, And it just became like a stigma. Like people were like, you don't drive drunk. Like you just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Like you're hurting other people on the roadways. I think similarly with like social media and smartphones, like the more Mm -hmm. parents can kind of raise their voices um, and bring attention to this, I think we can pass laws. And I think we can also just change the culture around kids having these devices um, to make it just to recognize those kind of collective action, like network effect problems, which is like, even if parents on their own told their child not to drive drunk, they're still not mm-hmm. safe on the roadways if other people are driving. 
drunk. And the the same with social media. You can keep your own kid off social media and every other parent, if they give their kids social media, it still affects the social environment for kids. So I do think that's why I've often pointed to them as like, this is a model like we could adopt and just trying to unite parents. Um, So have you heard of Mothers Against Media Addiction? Yeah. No, I was about to say so. Sorry. Okay. I was like, do you not know about them yet? No. And so I actually interviewed Julie Scalfa for my book because okay, I was like, you did it. I have thought about for years how we needed a mad and you did it. Mama, Mothers Against Media Addiction, is now trying to do the same thing for social media and smartphone addiction. And um, yeah, so that's super inspiring organization. I would recommend parents to their website. I know that they're trying to get more and more ways for parents to be involved at the local level, like to be involved in a local chapter with other parents. Um, and then they also try to keep parents aware through their just emails about um, just legislation campaigns, like letting parents know, hey, like in the state of New York, this bill is being considered like if you live in New York and you want to call your local representative, like let them know that you care about this issue. So I think those types of resources are so helpful. I mean, parents are busy. They don't have time to track all this legislation. Um, So I would say like using organizations like Mama, others like Fair Play. There's a lot of advocacy groups that you can find. And if you follow their work, they're great about blasting news out to parents of like critical times to call your Congress member or even your local state representative when there are state bills being considered. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot. Um, even It doesn't take much time, but just each parent raising their voice um, when that adds up, when a legislator gets like, I got a hundred phone calls today from parents. Okay. People really want this bill to protect their kids online like that does matter um and so i would say too like you were we were talking about schools a little bit and there's a lot parents can do to influence their schools like where they're involved more locally i think parents getting together in a school to ask for changes from the school or the school district level is also really powerful like contact your school board members um so i do think that we just need to be motivated and kind of encouraged to do it. I think parents often feel like, well, I don't have all the political savvy or awareness or technolo- like technical language about these things. You really yeah. don't have to. Right. Just tell them you right. care <laughs> and you want them know. to do something to protect your kids. Um, so you yeah. definitely, I do try to, when I talk to individual parents and they tell me how upset you know they are about this particular thing, I just really try to encourage them to channel that um, into making their voices known to people who are in positions to do something about it, which can be both at the school and local level and even at the national level. And, um, and so, yeah, I would definitely say check out mama um look at some other advocacy organizations like fair play and others who are involved in um trying to help parents be aware of what's going on in l- the legislation and um, how to get connected to join their efforts perfect yeah and so i will link to my interview with julie scalfo of mama and i will link to my interview with josh gullen who's the executive director yes. of fair play yes for listeners and and those websites too and i i went to a local chapter meeting for mama oh great it was about an hour and a half away from me there's nothing like super, super close local. yet and i'm like maybe i need to start my own chapter i'm thinking yeah. about that but but you can find someone somehow local to you or even start your own little yeah chapter. you can start your own yeah. That's right. right. And they provide you with the resources to, you know, discussion topics and things like that. So yeah, I forgot one more I should mention, and they're starting to grow more of a presence in the U.S. is called Smartphone Free Childhood. It was founded Mm -hmm. by two moms in the U.K. But if you go on their website, they have like a link kind of tree of uh, WhatsApp groups you can join and they have one for the U.S. And I'm in it and I honestly can't keep up with it. It's so uh, busy with activity. But yeah. um, parents who are really interested in that type of advocacy work, those WhatsApp groups are great. Like parents share lots of resources, things that they're doing in their school, and they'll often mm-hmm. share resources with each other. Like here's a PowerPoint I put together you can use to advocate for these policies in your school. And so um, I think just parents coming together and sharing resources is mm-hmm. so powerful. So I would also recommend that okay. as, a, as another option for getting involved. Making me feel guilty. I did get invited to that and I just don't have WhatsApp and I didn't want to download another That's- app. And I know that it's going to be a lot of conversation, but I do like, I need to get involved in that. And then <clears throat> you, you talked about speaking up at your school and I'm really passionate about that because starting local can be important around screens, whether it's if you believe in phone free schools um, or maybe taking a look at 
how kids are using the school issued devices. And we didn't get to go into that too much today, really. But <laughs> I want to link to your Newsweek article yeah. in the episode notes. And then maybe we'll have a follow on discussion specifically about screens at school, sure, data privacy issues and screen time and all of that um, separately. Yeah. And I can send you to, um, so on the school's front, I put out like a resource um, on the tech project page I run called like getting phones out of schools, which is that more, that's more focused about policies that schools should adopt around trying to remove smartphones from the school day. Um, and yeah. so that's a resource for parents and educators. And then also I did write the Newsweek piece because I think there's actually been so, like a lot of attention on phones, which is totally needed. But then I've also been trying to like say it's not just the phones because you get the phones out, but then these kids have these educational screens on their desks all day, which is, mm -hmm. I think lots of parents know tons of distractions can be on those screens that it's very difficult for teachers to police that the school yep. filtering software doesn't always catch what kids are accessing. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of the next, the next kind of phase of things I'm also trying to turn my attention to is like, how can we try to get schools to move away from so much? screen-based learning um, and the kind of mandatory yeah. devices that they're issuing. Yeah. And I know that there's some families taking legal action against schools and some of the ed tech companies for yeah. taking their kids' data without their consent, yes. um, which we talked a little bit about COPPA earlier. And yeah, schools are um, opting in for that on behalf of parents. And is that even allowed? And so um, please keep me updated on, I'm on board with any legislation that can help to regulate yeah. you know, or keep kids safer at school uh, with these devices too. So we're going to keep that conversation going. And I do think 2025 is going to be the year of the school issue device and like <laughs> something got to, something's got to give because That's right. it really was this year was all about phone free schools and, but yeah. they're getting access to all the same things on the, on, on the devices. Device. And yeah. And it just, it like, I think the other thing is it just like, it hasn't worked out. Like, I think there was this big push, like one laptop per child, every child gets a laptop is going to like improve our educational outcomes and reduce the achievement gap. And like the data really shows the opposite. Like, unfortunately, like national math and science and reading scores have continued to decline. And then if you really dig into the research, like the evidence continues to show that children learn better reading on paper versus a screen and they like retain more information by writing things mm -hmm. out by hand than typing. And like even a recent study by Columbia University found that like kids' brains, like the reading circuits, like they used MRI scans in the study, their brains engage on a deeper level with the text when they read it um, in print rather than on a screen. And so I think, yeah, it's not a mystery why then the laptops have not improved educational outcomes um, if we really understand the science behind learning. And so I'm hopeful, again, as more research comes out, um, that mm -hmm. we'll be able to kind of really push that effort to trying to get schools to move away from all the screen learning. Yeah, maybe your next book. Needs I know. <laughs> I do address I do address it in a chapter in my book. Like I talk about how it's not just the phones. We need to get yeah. these educational screens out too. But um, no, I mean, it could be its own entire book. There's just so much to say. So that's yeah. obviously true. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, Claire, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, we are, let's talk again closer to when your book comes out. Yeah. And um, I would love to get a copy when there's copies available. Absolutely. And we um, can listeners connect with you anywhere right now. Where do you recommend? Yes, so I have a Substack, um, Claire Morell, like dot Substack dot com, and I will be posting um, articles I'm writing, resources for parents and educators, all in the lead up to and after the release of my book. So you can follow my work most easily on my Substack. Yeah, just Google Claire Morell. It should pull up my Substack called Preserving Our Humanity. Um, is the name of it, and um, and otherwise you can also find me on my scholar page at the ethics and public policy center google claire morell and my scholar page collects basically all the resources that we put together okay. and articles i write so you can also follow me there and on twitter um so those are the places oh, that i'm posting about my work um but definitely i would say the easiest is probably just subscribing to my Substack, and then you'll just get yeah. whenever time i write something it'll just show up in your inbox so <laughs> yeah okay, perfect I will link to that in the episode notes. So Claire, thank you. And I want to talk to you again soon about um, more things. Yes. Well, thanks so much <laughs> for having me on. This is a great conversation.